episode 46. Hello again, everybody from the mid Midwest. You've got Life's Learning Curve, the podcast. I'm Paul Hart, your host. We're all about finding the best us through nonfiction storytelling. And for me, the best us. Today's true to real life episode unfolded a lot like a classic cinema movie. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Have you ever been with someone so inspiring, male or female, doesn't matter, but someone so inspiring that their enthusiasm rubbed off on you? In today's episode, this happens to me during a very delicate part of my life. It was the summer of 2013, and I was attending a film festival in the Florida Keys. Festival. It was the Humphrey Bogart Film Festival, which itself was fantastic. Bogart. For me, I had just walked away from a failing documentary that I produced, and I had had personal threats in my life, and they'd left me pretty much in shreds. I needed an escape, and desperate for a Bogart-style adventure of my own, I cynically squinted my eyes and set my sights on Key Largo in an event that renewed my state of mind for years and years to come. So let's find out more about this. Let's get going. Sebastian. Here we go. Life's Learning Curve. I'm Paul Hart. Episode Key Largo Reboot. Stand by. Stand by. Stand by. It was a dark and humid evening in Key Largo, typical for a July steamer on the Florida Keys, and there I sat in a cheap little motel, the Cocky Motel. It was set back just a few feet from the main road so you could hear the traffic, right off of Route A1A, which was the only road to access the small islands out to sea after leaving the mainland of Florida. It was the backbone road of any kind of travel to the tropical coral islands of the Florida Keys. Because it sat between the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean, I, it was common for that highway to be closed for some reason, damaged by storm surges, hurricanes or tropical storms even. However, so far the hurricane season had been a bust. No blow, no show. I downgraded to a basic room at the motel because it was just me. I had expected there might be two people going, but it was only me, just me. I sat in my room as an old ceiling fan rotated with a clicking rhythm, and I just had to smile. I sat all by myself, solo, once again, what I was used to. I was here to attend the Humphrey Bogart Film Festival, and there could not be a better setting than... Key Largo and the Florida Keys. It was the title and the setting of one of Bogart's best films. Now, Key Largo, the town, is the longest island in the Keys chain and the closest to the mainland of Florida. It gave its name to the 1947 movie starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, and portions of the film were filmed here. Humphrey Bogart's Key Largo connection is still evident there today, as you'll soon hear. So I had purchased two tickets to the Humphrey Bogart Film Festival many months prior to this. I was sure I'd have a great girlfriend by a festival time, but luck had not been with me, so I would make the best of it. Anxious, I couldn't help but wonder what adventure was ahead of me. Would I meet someone? Might I network with someone in the film community? Would I meet Stephen Bogart, Humphrey Bogart's son? Would I? The festival would consist of 15 classic Bogart films on three screens in the local theater. And each evening, this was the best part, each evening after the film, and sometimes before the film, patrons would all meet up for cocktails and conversations prior to the nighttime screenings. Under the stars at Key Largo's Visitor Center. It was beautiful. Just across the highway from the Visitor Center sat the actual African Queen small steamboat that Catherine Hepburn and Bogart used while shooting 
in Africa, John Huston's 1951 classic, The African Queen. Now, just attending this event left me with this feeling, the feeling that I was actually entering a Bogart film. <laughs> As for me, I had just left a documentary job down in Key West, at the bottom of the Keys. What had once been a smooth, straight shot of a production had turned sour, and I didn't actually know why. What I did know was that I was out of time to shoot, and I was out of capital. So, there I sat. As I had driven my gutless four-lunged rental car up the Florida Keys on that tropical, rainy, stormy Monday, the thoughts of that documentary, it was eating at my soul. But soon afterwards, I arrived and downgraded my room and checked into the Conky Motel. Welcome I drove that gutless four banger of a vehicle down to room 317 and I might as well have walked because my room was next to the office. <laughs> it was a small yet adequate room with just the bare essentials, bed, bath, TV. Oh, small air conditioner that rattled. As my ceiling fan in my room clicked, I looked out my half steamy window. It was late afternoon, and the sun had just come out from hiding, and it lit up the landscape like so many spotlights on a movie location. Just in time for me to find the nearest place to grab some food and a delicious adult beverage. After a shower and clean clothes, I walked next door to a place called the Caribbean Club. Real name, great place. Quite hungry, I stepped through the large blue entrance and immediately felt as if I'd been there before. You know that feeling you get? You look around and think, I've been here, I've seen this. It was familiar, but I had no idea why. I knew I really hadn't been there. The place was paneled with wood heavily. It was rustic Dade County cedar as a decor. This place had not tried to be a tropical bar, but it just was. Immediately, the Caribbean Club reminded me of a bar Humphrey Bogart himself might spend some time. Now, Humphrey Bogart once said the following, the problem with the world is that everyone is just a few drinks behind. <laughs> the people filling the place were mostly locals that night, and I like that. It was true flavor, real people. Hi, what can I get you, sir? Hi, uh, what are your specials? Tonight, hogfish and scallops. Uh-huh. It sounds great. <laughs> Tastes even better. Sure it does. That'll do, thanks. <laughs> As the sun sizzled into the gulf, a four-piece band came back from break and a more southern fried sound filled that bar. I sat and I nursed a couple of gin martinis, a favorite of Bogart's. I thought, well, I might as well. And when my fresh catch hogfish and scallops came, I ate like the hungry man I was. <laughs> I almost felt obligated to watch people that night. People watch, and besides the female middle-aged bartender who was on the better side of a 190 pounds taking my order, I spoke to no one else that night, but I had an idea I had to be back. This place suited me. Thank you, sir. Come on back, please. Thanks. The following day, about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, about 150 of the festival patrons assembled at the Key Largo Visitor Center for a general meeting. Schedules of films, times, places were distributed, and movie passes were handed out. I was given two passes as I had purchased two tickets. <laughs> Paul? Paul Hart. Where are you, sir? Oh, I have two passes for you. Who is your extra person? I'll make a tag and lanyard for them. Uh, it's just me. Uh, I'm solo. Embarrassed, I searched the crowd. I knew no one there. Now the ages ranged from film students to seniors. Probably 50, 50 male, female. Most came as couples or came as groups of friends. 
After orientation, we all moved into a larger, more comfortable space for our first of five evenings of cocktail parties before the movie. We were greeted by Stephen Bogart, Humphrey's son, Leonard Malton, film critic, and other Bogart representatives. Stephen Bogart opened by saying, Hello, I'm Stephen Bogart, and welcome to the Humphrey Bogart Film Festival here in beautiful Key Largo. We're all friends here. We're all fans, or combinations of both. <laughs> Grab a drink and let's celebrate my father's films and life. Cheers, everyone. Immediately, I saw that our hosts were all accessible. They wouldn't be distant, and they were very approachable to talk with. Bogart's wife, Lauren Bacall, was supposed to attend, but had been in poor health and wouldn't be there. I kind of liked that the dress for these events was cocktail party casual, 1950s and 1940s style, which seemed very appropriate for a Humphrey Bogart Film Festival. Now I have to tell you, I tried my best to mix, to mingle, and to enter group conversations, but I felt awkward. Each time I tried, awkward. Where's my adventure, I wondered. How come I can't, I? If I was to step into an adventure, I would need to step away from my anxiety neutral position. Therefore, the following five festival days were going to have to find me outside my modest and somewhat shy comfort zone. Now, first off, I need to explain something. I'm going to use a term frequently, so I guess I'd better define it. And the term is film noir, N-O-I-R. Film noir is a type of crime film featuring a cynical, malevolent character or characters set in a sleazy setting, and there's an ominous atmosphere of things might happen that is conveyed by shadowy harsh lit photography and foreboding background music you put that all together film noir Bogart did a few of these now this isn't a movie review so I'm not going to sit and review his films I like them all for the most part some more than others I am a fan of Humphrey Bogart's work especially when his pal and drinking partner, John Houston, directed him. And that week on my own at a local theater, I screened the following Bogart films. A Western adventure drama from 1946 called The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. A 1941 crime drama shot in film noir called The Maltese Falcon. 1951's The African Queen and To Have and To Have Not, where Humphrey Bogart met his future wife, Lauren McCall. And who can forget the dramatic romance war film 1942's Casablanca? Lighting, mood, music, score, Humphrey Bogart's acting, and all the adventure. Without giving anything away, this film reminds us that Doing what is right is sometimes more important than doing what you might selfishly desire. I'm not here to review these films, but I was already hooked even more after I viewed these films again back to back, day after day. After a while, everyone begins to talk like the cadence from the Bogart films. <laughs> now, in the evening at the film festival, there would be... I said, a cocktail party, as I said before, followed by a screening of a Bogart film outside at the water's edge on a huge screen. I began to recognize a few like-kind people who really liked the art of filmmaking. These were the younger film students. I remember Sid, Will, David, all around the ages of 20 through 25. And here I sat with them talking, twice their age at least, but fitting into their conversations. The sun set each night right on cue and painted the western horizon. A good sunset is like falling in love and letting go all at the same time. We went on to watch Bogart's In a Lonely Place, a film noir picture. It was a commentary on a lot of things, but Hollywood's mores and the, the pitfalls of celebrity and near celebrity, perfect for Humphrey Bogart. 
Out of all the festival films we watched that week, this lesser popular film, In a Lonely Place, really engaged the audience. After a warm audience reception, Stephen Bogart and Leonard Maltin took the stage and announced that Humphrey Bogart's film production company he created back in the 1950s called Santana Films was once again active and was proud to be releasing a new film in the classic style of film noir. Under the direction of Stephen Bogart and his mother Lauren Bacall, Santana Films had produced a new film titled This Last lonely place. And what followed was a promo for that film, which was projected up on the giant silver screen where actors and actresses existed in a larger than life way. The promo delivered a gutty, weary protagonist working a cab when something happens and changes his perception of what is safe and what's not. It was just a three minute promo, but it was intense and exposed the nighttime underbelly of Los Angeles. Action and plot twists seemed well executed, and the cinematic night shots of LA were beautiful and leaned heavily in the style of film noir, but in color, that was interesting to me. As the lights came up after the promo, the audience went up for grabs. Next, we were introduced to the feature's female lead star, an actress from Canada, Canadian actress Carly Pope, and film cinematographer Patrick Mead Jones. Whoa, that's actually her, I thought in my film geeky way. <laughs> from where I sat outside in the beautiful darkness in those mid-sized folding chairs, she glowed and she glistened like the movie star she was. I was becoming more and more film geeky than ever. <laughs> By that time, I was able to somehow step away from my anxiety neutral position. Later that night, I returned to the Caribbean Club and saw a couple of my new festival friends there. And we sat out back in the very tropical palm tree picnic table area where the waves glistened as they toppled over the sand rhythmically. We laughed, we had a few drinks and told our own unusual, ironic and quirky film production stories that we'd all gone through. Delicious beverages were consumed and little did I know, I was beginning my Bogart adventure and at, of all places, the Caribbean Club. Perfect. Now let me tell you something, what's that said? The problem with the world is that everyone's a few drinks behind. <laughs> yeah, Bogart quote, caught ya. How about the new film? What's it called? Uh, That Last Lonely Place. It's like the film title we watch tonight. It's film noir, right? That's what I got from it. Yeah, David, the preview definitely was film noir. It was shadowy and crime-filled, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Hi, gentlemen. Is there anything I can get you, drinks? Appetizers? Oh, not right now. Not Thank you. Me. Thank you. I couldn't help but overhear you boys. Bogart fans? Oh, you bet. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've been you talking bet. about his films here all night. Boys, let me share something with you. This club, the Caribbean Club, is the location for the exterior shots for that film, his film, called Key Largo. No kidding. The writers of the film used this place as an inspiration for the scripts as well. Really? Look out back there, out to the pier. Now that's where the boat, Frank McCloud, Bogart's uh, character, cast off from in the film's climax scene. Oh, yeah. The pier, the one over here, led to the club's back door, which is still here. It's that door. It was shot back in 1947, 1948, I believe. You got it. That was why this place looks so familiar. I had seen it in a Bogart uh, film. Look at that. The exterior had been shot more than 50 years prior to me even being there. But it was so recognizable as the exteriors to the film Key Largo. The following night, under the stars, we watched the film Key Largo. My film group friends sat there in one group. We sat there, and, and there, as if preserved just for us, was the Caribbean Club, but back in the 1940s. 
looking as if it was just shot yesterday. <laughs> as film geeks, we just embraced that coincidence. After the film at the cocktail party, my new group of film friends, Will, Sid, and David, we all assembled again, and we took a crack at the lighting for the mood of the film Casablanca, which we had seen the previous night. As Sid talked about accomplishing hard-to-light situations for film noir, I left to refresh my gin martini. I returned to the group, but was surprised to find a new person had been added to our group. It was a slight-looking, dark-haired female who seemed to know more than the rest of us about film noir and film in general. We were, after all, among an eclectic group. This is to be expected. She listened and shared knowledge of just how the pros achieved that look back in the 1940s and 1950s. We all listened to her. We talked. We laughed. We learned a lot until slowly the evening wore us down. And one by one, we said our goodnights and left. I'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow would be the final big day of the film festival. Good. The closing day. And there would be a formal dinner dance. And it was going to be held in a Casablanca-like style in the ballroom of an elegant old hotel in Key Largo. I was the last to leave our group that night. And as I excused myself from the female still chatting with people, I suddenly turned back around and realized I had just spent my evening talking with film star Carly Pope from this last lonely place. What? Oh my, oh. Immediately I became tongue-tied but got out the words uh, and uttered something like, uh, Mind if I uh, get a picture with you, with you Miss Pope? <clears throat> she realized that I had realized <laughs> and she was really kind and obliged. Just me. But I never will forget her desire to just fit in and hang out with the festival people. I guess she was just like me, trying to find some like-kind person with whom to hang out and enjoy their evening. The final night came and about 300 or so film festival participants all seemed to be costumed in Bogart's character, Rick, from the Casablanca film. White tux, dinner jacket, black pants, bow tie, cummerbund. A grand ballroom had been converted to the style of Bogart's era in the 1940s look of a Casablanca cafe. Giant, giant curtains were draped across the ballroom and large Moroccan vases were placed everywhere. A full orchestra kicked off tunes from the big band era. The food was hearty, and even the smell uh, throughout the room was this incense-like sweet smell. Around 40 tables were set for formal dining experiences, and although I sat with costume people I did not know, including a man boasting a tall turban wrapped around his head and a bright red sash down his front, I found myself having a few intelligent conversations, at least what I consider to be intelligent uh, like to conversations you. with some like-kind people. They all loved uh, film and they all loved Humphrey Bogart. And a few laughs, a few drinks helps as well. My table mates were bright and they were upbeat and we had a good evening, a heck of a good evening, which included me dancing later with several pre-octogenarian women, oh, wow, nice. older women, and they were very good. They were happy and greatly appreciated getting up to carefully move and trot around the dance floor slowly. I nodded to my film school friends as well as to Carly Pope, way over on the other end of the room. I didn't really talk to him that night. But throughout the evening, I noticed the cinematographer Patrick Mead Jones from the latest Santana release, called This Last Lonely Place. He was shooting photos and stills of the event. Okay. The gala event would certainly complete my adventure, I thought. I couldn't have been more wrong.
On my way out of the ballroom, I was invited by the man with the high wrapped turban from our table to join him and his wife. Oh, excuse me, Paul. I'd be greatly honored if you joined my wife and I for a highball or two at the Caribbean Club. Yeah. You care to join us? Sure. I'm honored. The Caribbean Club it is. Tropical and hot, even in the darkness of night, I, I took off my dinner jacket, my bow tie, my cummerbund, and loosened my shirt a button. Grab the table over there. We entered the club, and the place was packed with locals and tourists, and after all, it was a Saturday night. I do not recall the actual conversations that night, but here's what I do recall. Sitting out back, once again, accompanied by a bright moon and the rhythmic waves slapping the sand, we sipped our gin martinis. But it wasn't more than a few minutes when we were surprised. Joining our table was actress Carly Pope Hi, everybody. and the cinematographer Patrick Mead Jones. It turns out the man in the high wrap turban was one of the executive producers of Santana Films' release, This Last Lonely Place. I realized that I had been chosen. I was an honored guest. And as time passed, the waves hit the shore as we slowly consumed icy gin martinis in the tropical night. Not bad, huh, Paul? I surprised myself because it was the filmmaker in me that made me gravitate toward Patrick, the cinematographer. My documentary work on my own seemed so intermediate or even beginner to his level of work. I had an earnest and honest conversation with Patrick, the cinematographer. He listened as I expressed my desire to take my skills in cinematography up a step. Now, Patrick could have blown me off or walked away or just nodded and smiled. But it turns out that Patrick was a nurturer. He was a terribly bright young guy who really embraced what he did. We talked lenses, we talked focal length, we talked lighting, settings, locations, achieving film noir, the value sound has to a scene. Now Carly Pope, the actress, inserted a lot of stories of shooting in the dark wee hours in Los Angeles and the problems they had to endure, mostly with coyotes, the animals, in the city, and the unsheltered homeless. These were their streets, they felt, and they took pride in seeing that the movie companies shouldn't interrupt the quiet of their turf at night. <laughs> For me, this was like a master class in film, but a master class with martinis. It was addictive for me. I couldn't stop listening. My enthusiasm only fueled Patrick's passion for the craft of cinematography. He lived it. We talked and we talked. Well after 2 a.m., the Bogart Film Festival party people raged on. Totally spent and exhausted. I had a feeling I should wobble back to my small motel room at the Conkey Motel. Patrick noticed me gathering my jacket and leaned in and said something. It's a conversation I've never forgotten. Hey, Paul, see this camera I'm shooting with tonight? Yeah, nice, Pat. What is that, a Canon? Yeah, it's a Canon 5D. It's, a, it's in DSLR. Nice camera for shooting stills. Hey, Paul, let me tell you something I don't tell everyone. This camera was the camera I shot the entire Santana film with. This one in five prime lenses. Really? I know this camera is a journeyman's tool, but I studied it. I learned it backward and forward, and I discovered, as the film's DP, how to make a first-rate, high-resolution film for Santana Films. Uh-huh. I can make this camera shine, Paul. Right. You saw the promo last night, right? What did you think? Right. Patrick, I thought it was shot on an airy camera or some great film camera, real film with, with great lenses. The imagery was breathtaking. You shot that on this? Yeah. Paul, think about it. 
you've worked with shooters that know their specs backwards and forwards and can quote the manual right back to you, right? Right. You know those guys. Yeah. Let me tell you something. I have never hired a shooter like that, the guy that knows all the specs. I don't want them to know the specs. I want them to understand the specs. I want my camera operator to actually know every nuance of that camera and know what to do to make the appropriate changes in an instant. It's not important to quote the camera specs from the manual. What's important is how you use the camera. <laughs> that really makes good sense, Patrick, of course. Listen, you can have all the best lighting, shot composition, audio, right. great acting, great locations, fantastic color grading, but if the camera's output is less than amazing and inconsistent all the way through, there is nothing unique to watch. For me, the depth of field, the lenses, and the precise settings of this very basic camera made film editing into art. I didn't expect it. It did it. I just had to know how to make it perform to its best. Paul, no matter how high-end or low-end of a camera you have, right. know it like it's your best friend, your best girlfriend. Now, my head was spinning. It was probably a combination of the gin and, more importantly, the value of Patrick's advice. Oh, I heard him loud and clear. As I turned away for a second to gather my jacket, I turned back and Patrick was gone, probably to get another delicious beverage. But it was my time to leave as well. So, did I have my adventure? Well, it's all how you look at it. Yes and no. I had no Humphrey Bogart adventure of cynicism, adventure, and drama. But I did have something. I had a new beginning, which created many more new adventures. I almost learned how to have more adventures. After that night, I have to say that I treated my cameras like my best girlfriend. We got to know one another, and over the years, we have created many different moods, elicited many different emotions, and I'd like to think we made pieces of cinema with a value, ones that were worth people's time to watch. Through the years, we've shot documentaries, fictional screenplays, and even short-form pieces for film festivals. And throughout the years, when my eyes changed and were just not as sharp, I felt as if my camera was telling me something. Hey, go get larger playback monitors. <laughs> So what is our takeaway? What did I learn? Hot, unforgivable, tropical June days, which morphed into humid, sweat-stained shirts at night, actually meant something. It was my environment that nourished me. And each day, I had viewed a daily dose of film noir, masterpieces of actor Humphrey Bogart. Now, I entered this film festival to experience a Bogart-style adventure. But instead, I got a cinematographer's dream masterclass with martinis. <laughs> I had met up with someone so inspiring that their enthusiasm rubbed off on me, and I stepped up. Stepped up my camera knowledge, my willingness to share my enthusiasm with others interested in film, just like Patrick was to me. I stepped up to find a better me waiting in the wings. And the learning curve continues. For Life's Learning Curve, I'm Paul Hart. Subscribe to Life's Learning Curve at lifeslearningcurve.org and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podchaser.
episode 46, Key Largo Reboot of Life's Learning Curve podcast was put together by producer Sebastian T. Dog, executive producer Paul Hart, technical director Heidi Cerner, editor Paul Richards, audio and sound Riley Hart, production manager Kevin Sanderson, audio equipment manager Patrick Mickelson, broadcast engineer Danielle Morve. Find us on Facebook and listen to us just about everywhere podcasts are heard. Visit our website, lifeslearningcurve.org, and please subscribe, read a blog, or shoot us an email. This episode has imaginative voice recreations to protect the privacy of others. Names have been changed and characters conflated. I'm Paul Hart, and we will be back soon with more stories from... Life's Learning Curve. Work clear. Work clear. Work clear.